Reading with your kids. Hola, Nihal, Kunichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Muni Muli Wanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please do subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Allie Melaninko. She is here to celebrate Ghost Girl. And a little later on in the show, we'll hear a sneak preview of a great new podcast. It's called Once Upon an Upset. And the host is our friend Jessica Laura Kane. Before we invite Allie into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by I Love a Good Book, a delightful and necessary children's book to inspire children, especially young boys, to love books and reading. And it's written by our friend Dr. Kimberly Harris. From learning his shapes and letters with Grandma first thing in the morning to snuggling up with Daddy after a bath, one little boy loves time spent reading a good book with his loved ones. But he has a secret. Can you guess his favorite way to read a good book? Jump into the pages of this delightfully tasty book to find out what makes reading so great. This really is a necessary book because so many boys report loving reading. It's We don't want to lose these kids. I Love a Good Book is the first book and the Boys Unbox series, which was written to help boys from the ages of zero to six establish an early positive relationship with books and a solid foundation with reading. Join the I Love a Good Book movement and help to inspire a new generation of young readers, especially young boy readers. I Love a Good Book by Dr. Kimberly Harris. Joining us right now from the place where all the cool kids live, Brooklyn, New York. Our guest today is part of the Spooky Middle Grade Authors Group. We love the Spooky Middle Grade Authors, and we love our new friend, Allie Malenko. She's here to celebrate her middle grade novel, Ghost Girl. Hey, Allie, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm still smiling over um, uh, the the... The original story that you and your buddies at the Spooky Middle Grade Authors created for the podcast, I called it um, Revenge of the Smart Home or something like that. But it was uh, a really super fun project, and it's so neat to be a, to, to have great, talented writers like you be a part of the show. Oh, thank you. That was so much fun to work on. That was the first time I've ever done anything like that. Um, and it was just, it was so great to see where everybody took the story to and the collaborative vibe. It was, a, it was so much fun. So hopefully we can do it again next year. Yeah. So just so it, it, if you don't know what we're talking about, basically the spooky middle grade authors are a group of, what was it, 15 or so authors? I think it's about 15 or 15 to 20 on average, you yep. know, people come and go at different times, but yeah. Yep. So they support each other. They help each other promote their books. They do virtual visits together. Um, and uh, I, I think it was six or seven of them came together. I gave them a prompt. Um, uh, Jonathan Rosen this time around started and kind of wrote the first few paragraphs and then handed it off. And then that went from one author to another and, no one knew uh, after after you wrote your part, no one knew what was coming after until you all get together to read it. Yeah, that was the especially fun part is getting to see like where it went from like where we left off. So that was it was a really good time. And I've never done anything like that before. So it was a lot of fun for me. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's kind of, um, you know, I think authors, uh, you know, these people, they, they work not in solitude because authors smart authors have editors and people that they do work with um but there's still like a lot of that control it's like this is my baby and in in a collaborative effort like that it's like well this is my section and i kind of think i know where i want it to go from here but it's out of my hands right now yeah, and that it, it, it is. It is. I mean, like, yes, we have agents and we have editors and we have like beta readers, but so much of writing is just you at the laptop, fingers crossed, hoping for the best, 
and that the story is working and that someone's going to find it engaging. So to do something like this, just to be like, okay, this is my piece. We'll see what happens next and hand it off. It's just so liberating too. I was like, not my problem to solve. I don't have to think of an ending because when I, when I agreed to do it, I was like, I will definitely do this. But since it's the first time, I don't want to start and I don't want to finish. So they were like, no problem. <laughs> they just slotted me right in the middle. And I was like, okay, I can do this. This is my spot. Well, you <laughs> certainly had to come up with a beginning, a middle and end for Ghost Girl. Tell us about it, please. Sure. So Ghost Girl is my debut spooky middle grade book. Um, It is the story of Z Puckett, who lives in a small town with her best friend, Elijah, who lives around the corner, and her bully, who eventually becomes her friend, Nellie. And what happens in the story is that a big storm comes to town, and they notice after they start doing cleanup that there's some people missing. And then... There is a creepy new principal that shows up at the school, and he has the power to help people manifest their deepest wishes. So whatever they truly want the most, he can make that happen for them. And so it it starts to go very bad for a lot of people in town, because when you're only thinking about the things that you want the most, then you're not thinking about what's good for the whole community. Um, and it comes down to, at the same time this is all happening, um, Z realizes that she inherited this gift from her mother and she can see ghosts and she can talk to them. And so she gets charged with helping them move on so that they can get past why they're still on, on earth. And at the same time, she has to, her and Elijah and Nellie have to team up, figure out who Principal Scratch really is, how he can do what he does and figure out how to stop them. Wow. So it's a pretty big adventure. <laughs> it sounds like it. There's a, there's a lot going on there. That whole... <laughs> That whole idea that, you know, when we're only focused on what's best for us, we completely stop thinking about what's best for others. I I don't know about you, Allie, but I got a feeling we're kind of living living that right now in a lot of ways. Yeah, it does. It feels weirdly, really topical. Not that it was meant to be, but it it definitely does. Because unfortunately, there are a lot of people who aren't thinking about the greater good and what they can do to help the greater good. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was something that was really important to me when I was telling this story. Um, And I just think I felt like, you know, Z as a character has lived in my head for a really long time, and I could never find the right story to slot her into. And telling a story about a girl who loves storytelling and who loves all things spooky and also understands that just because you're getting what you think you want doesn't mean it's good. You know, I, I, that was really important to me to understand, like that, to tell the kind of story that kids would read where they would realize that, you know, just because it's good for you doesn't mean it's good for everyone Mm -hmm. and that that matters. And that needs to be taken into consideration. Just, you know, kind of explode that little empathy a little bit more, you know, get people thinking outside of just what they would like to see happen. Yeah, that really is. It's and it's an important lesson for I think all of us to learn, but it's especially important, I think, for kids at this middle grade level to learn, uh, you know, because we've gone from being an infant and only able to think for ourselves and think for what I need at this moment. I need it right now. I'm going to scream. <laughs> and hopefully by the time kids are getting into middle school and high school, they start to think, well, Maybe I can forego a little bit of this grat- gratification to help the people in my community. Yeah. I mean, the, one of the big storylines in it is about bullying, too. And there's the bullying that takes place with Nellie and Z, which the way I wrote it is that it kind of it kind of goes both ways, which I think was important, too, is that it's not just like it's not just Z sees it as she's the one getting picked on. But like Nellie also sees it as she's the one who's being targeted. Um, and I wanted to like show kind of the complexity of what happens when people stop helping each other. Um, and also one of the other storylines in there is for Elijah and his father and Elijah's father really, Elijah is overweight and his father really wants him to get fit and be physical. And it's a struggle for Elijah because he's very content with who he is as a person and he loves himself and he just wishes his dad would love him for the way he is too. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how sometimes, you know, the people that love you cannot see you for who you are and maybe can engage 
in what feels like bullying too. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a tough one for parents. I think, (laughs) you know, it's really tough because you want the best for your kid. You want to love them. And a lot of times what we think is loving you know what we think our loving suggestions hey you're really talented and uh but do you want to you know maybe have a salad instead of that cheeseburger do you want to come out and you know put down the video game and go for a run and it's it's coming from a loving place but it can feel to the child like they're being bullied or like the parents don't love them Exactly. And that, and that is like one of the, one of the most frank conversations that Elijah winds up happening, having with Z in the book is that he just struggles with this idea that like, you know, he's the smartest kid in the school and he is a happy kid and he doesn't understand why his dad can't see all of the things about him that are, are working. And is just solely focused on this one aspect of him that his dad has decided is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really Really, like that was important to me to talk about too, because I, like you said, I do think that parents can definitely think that they're coming from a place of kindness and helpfulness. But when you're on the receiving end of that information, you got to make sure that that's really how it's being registered. You know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a a, a, a tightrope, I think, for a lot of, and I think one of the things that makes it even more difficult. And we've talked about this uh, with a lot of different authors on the show is that we're living in a time right now, especially here in the United States and in other Western countries where we're so mobile, we're so spread out. And, you know, when I was growing up, you know, if my dad and my mom were ragging, quote unquote, ragging on me about something, um, I had my grandmother down the street and she was my Mm -hmm. best bud. And so I had people in my family that were close by that I knew would love me, would help remind me that my parents love me and that they're, you know, the suggestions they're making are, they might seem a little bit overwhelming right now. You don't want to hear it, but it's coming from a loving place. And, um, and, and kids don't have that these days. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, uh, I mean, when, even when I was growing up, like it was, my, my relatives lived far away. Mm -hmm. So like, it was basically just my sisters and my parents and I, and I think that it, it is good. You know, I think it's harder, like you said, now when you don't have someone that you can go to down the street, that is still your family, but not necessarily your parents who are like, not you and them are not communicating the way you had hoped. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, I, it's, it's like, being more spread out makes it also just like a lot more insular, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You were saying one of your characters has this ability to talk to dead folks <laughs> and to help them along. I love that. And that's a neat thing in the story. I'm, as, as a, someone who's, who's been performing magic for over 30 years and has run into people who actually claim to be able to do that and use that claim to build people out of money. I, I think it's fun to, to read about, but I think it's also, for me, I would just jump as a parent. I, if I'm co-reading, co-reading this with my kids or with a group uh, of kids in a school, I'd be all over that and, and just to say, hey, this is really fun in the story, but if you ever meet someone who tells you they can really talk to dead people... Walk away from them. Cause... Run away. Yeah. <laughs> Run away. They might not have the best of intentions. They might, in fact, be a lot more like Principal Scratch <laughs> than they would be like Z. <laughs> so, yes. Yes, of course. It's a fun thing to do in the story. And it was. it also allowed me to explore um, one of the other themes of the book, which is about grief, because Z's mom is gone. And that loss really resonates with Z because she died right after Z was born um, from a complication. And Z goes through this this struggle in the book where it feels like there's no world in which they could both exist and how to deal with that. And then when she learns she inherited this gift from her mother when her sister's explaining to her, because her sister can't do it. But when she explains to her that, you know, mom used to be able to talk to ghosts and it was a really good thing and she really loved it and it, she helped people, you know, it becomes something that she could share with this woman that 
is her mother who she never really got to know. And it's a way for her to like work through her grief too. So I think it, you know, yes, for sure. If you meet anyone who tells you that they can do this, run away. But in the story, it's, it's a means for, for Z to, you know, come to terms with the fact that, you know, like her mother loved her and it's okay. It's, it's okay. Yeah. 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 And, and I certainly have no, no problem. It's certainly in my faith tradition to, you know, think that we can, when somebody passes that they're still listening and looking over us. And, um, that's comforting. I remember my, my, my mom suffered from Parkinson's and dementia and, uh, and it was a very difficult time, uh, especially for my kids who were in, in high school at the time, especially my, my daughter who was very close to my mom. And when my mom finally passed and, you know, I was consoling my daughter, uh, one of the things she said to me was, well, now I can speak to her again. Because she Aww. couldn't, yeah, because she really, my mom really couldn't speak to us and, uh, when she was with us in the last few years. That's Princi- really beautiful. Principal Scratch, <laughs> is there somebody in your life that inspired this character? Yes. Um, <laughs> he's not in my life. He's in the world. <laughs> but okay. he's he's not my friend <laughs> or anything. Um, so there is a musician by the name of Nick Cave. And he has a band, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. He's been around for a while. And I started listening to them just kind of out of nowhere. Like, I'd always heard of them. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to listen in some Nick Cave. And he has a song. Um, well, there are there are actually <laughs> there are actually 17 references to Nick Cave's music in Ghost Girl, like little Easter eggs that I did just for me because <laughs> I thought it was funny because um, I'm writing this book for kids and I'm going to like pepper it with this like rock stars like references. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that Nick Cave's music is a big, like a big contributor to the character that Scratch became. Um, and, you know, he has this, this, he wears this one red glove on his hand and Nick Cave has a song called, you know, the red right hand. And that glove is what he uses when he clamps down on the kid's shoulders. That's how he like sort of siphons their energy and manifests what they want, but also sort of like, uh, like a psychic vampire kind of drains them. Um, So yeah, I would say that there's definitely influence and the whole, as I mentioned before, Z's like been kind of bouncing around in my head for a while. And I was walking up the subway steps one day and one of Nick Cave's songs came on called on my headphones called Tupelo. And it starts out with this big crash of thunder. And it was like, in that moment, I was like, ah, oh, a storm. Like I'll have a storm. Like it all of a sudden the beginning of the book totally took place. Like there's been a storm and a stranger comes to town. And what is the stranger doing? And it's like all the dominoes started falling in place. So yeah, definitely influenced by Nick Cave, but no, Sadly, he's not my friend. I wish he was. He seems like a very cool guy. <laughs> well, we, uh, we're we going to encourage you to send uh, Nick a copy of Ghost Girl and, and see if you can get a quote for it. Uh, oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, I'm wondering in that moment, because I've, I've had that mo- uh, that experience too, where an idea for a story, it, 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 for me, the most vivid memory uh, – moment for me um, when this happened was uh, right before I wrote my um, disability awareness video meltdown, I was at a a UB40 concert and the whole video script played in my mind as I'm listening to, I think it was Red Red Wine, but I, I, I had a moment of pure joy and then utter panic because I'm like, I don't have anything to write this down with, and this is before cell phones and all that stuff. And I'm like, I, I don't, I can't lose this. Did you have that moment on the subway stairs? I did, but I had my cell phone, uh. <laughs> so I was at an advantage. So as soon as I got up the steps, and I was very close to home, so I jotted down like on my phone some initial ideas, and then I came home and like sketched it out a little more. Fully, but yeah, I also, in the same way, I have lost so many ideas that I will think of in the middle of the night, like when I wake up and I'm like just restless and I'll be like, oh, wait, 
this would solve that plot problem. And I'll be like, I'll remember it in the morning. You don't have to write it down. And I never remember it in the morning. And I'm still doing it. Like, it's like, I just, I don't, I don't know why I can't learn. Like, just keep something by the bed and write it down because you're not going to remember. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I feel you. I feel for you in that UB40 moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I, I did get home. It still was in my mind. I think I was in uh, very rude to the people I was with because I was just like, just running it over through my mind. But then I get home and there was a power outage. So I had to write it on, by candlelight. That's amazing. <laughs> very gothic. <laughs> So you're telling us that this is your debut spooky middle grade book. Um, did you catch the bug? Is this the first of many to come, we hope? So it is. My second book is actually coming out next summer, which is really awesome. exciting. Yeah. So um, it's not a sequel. Um, some very delightful kids have asked me for one, which I wouldn't be against, but I'd have to really come up with the – because this was very much – planned. Ghost Girl was planned as a standalone, so I'd have to come up with a really good storyline. Um but my second book that is out next summer is called This Appearing House. And it, when you, it's supposed to sound like Disappearing House. And it's a haunted house story. So I'm sticking with the spooky vibe because those were my favorite books growing up. And, um, but a whole new set of characters and a whole new storyline. So, yeah, that'll be out on August. Very, very cool. Real, yeah. We're really excited for you. Um, so you enjoy writing for this age group and this audience? I do. Honestly, um, I had a really weird journey to publishing. I spent a long time, like probably at least probably more than seven years writing and rewriting a young adult book um, that was like an urban fantasy. It like the the magical system was all built around the game of chess. And I loved this book. I loved it. And I worked on it. I worked on it. I worked on it. And I got my agent and we went out on submission And everyone came back saying it's not young adult. It's actually middle grade because the central driving storyline is a girl looking for her grandfather who's gone missing. And they're like, that's not young adult. When you do young adult, you know, it has to be like you leave family out of it. I don't necessarily agree with, but whatever. That was the major consensus. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, I know, right? I was like, well, I'm pretty sure teenagers care about their families too, but okay. A little. At least we we want to encourage them to. (laughs) So, you know, they were like, a lot of editors were like, we take another look at it if you turn it into middle grade. And so my agent was like, do you want to do this? And I was like, okay, sure. So I sat down and I quite literally like broke the bones of this book and re like remanufactured it like a Frankenstein monster into a middle grade book. And it made me, there was a lot of crying. There was a lot of anxiety. I, I, I came away from it being like, I don't think I like writing anymore. I don't Mm -hmm. like how this feels. But I realized I had a choice. So either I was just going to quit writing, which I didn't want to do because this was a dream of mine for so long, or I have to go write something completely new. And I thought about the books that mattered the most to me when reading was like a, a, a savior, you know, like when you're in that, that, middle grade, the middle school time where like the escapism of reading was so important to me when I was a kid. And all my favorite books were the spooky ones, you know, the weird ones. And I was like, okay, so let's, let's go down that Avenue instead. And after having spent so many years writing that YA book, I wrote ghost girl in like six months and I sent it to my agent and she emailed me back within like a couple hours. And she was like, this is it. This is your debut. And she was right. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we are so happy. Uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm kind of bummed out that the editors were telling you, no, nah, you know, teenagers yeah, it don't was, like kids. It was weird. Like- it was really weird because it was still very much like a YA book. You know, there was like a love interest and there was like a found family storyline. And it was just like, yeah, the driving story, though, is about like a 15 or 16. I can't remember what age she was year old girl looking for her missing grandfather and that feels like middle grade and it wasn't even just like one editor said that it's like a bunch of editors you know were like if you rewrite it as middle grade we take another look and i'm like this doesn't feel like middle grade to me but okay mm. and i did and i don't think it was particularly very good as middle grade so like i said it was just my only option was either to like throw in the towel or just fall back in love with storytelling again which i'm really glad i did <laughs> 
Well, we're really, really happy that you fell back in love with storytelling and that you took the time to tell the ghost girl story. Uh, tell us now, Allie, where we can go to find out more about Ghost Girl and find out more about you. Sure. So there's my website, um, which is just AllieMalinenko.com. Um, and I'm on Instagram at Allie Malinenko and on Twitter at Allie Malinenko. And you can email me through my website. I'm happy to talk to people. I love connecting with um, teachers, you know, and doing class visits. We've been doing a bunch of virtual class visits with the Spooky Group and on my own. So, yeah, if you reach out, I'm happy to come and talk about storytelling and writing books and, you know, the magic that is literature. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. We've had a great time speaking to the author of Ghost Girl, Ali Melaninko. Hey, Ali, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. I had a great time. Right now, we'd love to give you a little taste of a great new podcast for parents and kids. We think you'll love it. It's called Once Upon an Upset, and it's hosted by our friend Jessica Laurel Kane. Here is Once Upon an Upset. Welcome to Once Upon an Upset, a podcast of stories and conversations to help make sense of difficult times. I'm your host, Jessica Laurel Kane. This week's episode is a short conversation called Listening to Our Younger Selves. I remember being little and carrying the weight of all the stories I was secretly collecting about my own experiences. I wanted so badly to share these experiences with someone who might have the time to understand and appreciate what I was going through, but I couldn't find the right person. I wanted so badly for someone to tell me that my stories were special and beautiful and that they were worth telling, but I was too scared my stories wouldn't be appreciated or worth telling. I didn't understand that the point of telling our stories is not to get approval for them, but to get them out into the light and oxygen where they can breathe and share their important messages with us about who we are. As I grew older, I realized my younger self was still there, still wanting so badly to share her stories. So finally, I went to work for her, trying to find someone who might have some time to listen. And I really wish I could tell you it hadn't taken me so long before it occurred to me that I was the person this young girl had been waiting for. Once I figured it out, I asked the little girl to tell me her stories. And I couldn't believe it. Her stories were wonderful stories, full of feelings big and small and magical. I couldn't wait to hear more. And I cherished each one instead of judging them or making them wrong. And finally, that little girl had a chance to be heard and seen as the star of her own experiences. Some of us parent our own children. Some of us are parenting our own children within. And many of us do both at the same time. I hope if you're listening, whether you're young or not young, you'll take the time to stop what you're doing and listen to the stories within you to remember how much they matter. Because each one has the ingredients that created the incredible human being that you are today. You've been listening to Once Upon an Upset. This week's episode was written, produced, and edited by me, Jessica Laurel Kane. And the music was made by Jerome Rawson at Fresh Made Music. For illustrations, merchandise, and more, please visit onceuponanupset.com. And don't forget to subscribe. See you next week. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Zeta Elliott. She'll be here to celebrate The Witch's Apprentice, the latest in her Dragons in a Bag series. want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to thank our guest, Ali Malinenko. Please be sure to check out Ghost Girl. We want to thank Dr. Kimberly Harris. Be sure to check out I Love a Good Book. 
want to thank Jessica Laro Kane for that uh, that great preview of Once Upon an Upset. Also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you so much for everything you did to make 2021 as normal and wonderful for your kids as you could. And of course, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next episode of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.